You're listening to Finding Your Genius Zone with Dirk Novell. With the help of successful individuals across industries, Dirk breaks down the unknown parts of every vocation while highlighting the importance of finding a career where you can leverage your natural skills, passions, and interests. Now here's your host, Dirk Novell. Everybody, this is Dirk Novell. Welcome to my podcast. On with me today is an old friend, Rob Reeves. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, man. I've been kind of bugging Rob for a while to come on, and uh, he is in Haley, Idaho. Um, and, you know, a couple things about Rob. Um, you know, I met Rob back at UW. And tell me, Rob, if I'm messing this up, but I remember at, when I was a Rush chairman recruiting you, and you're the recruiter, I re I think if I remember, didn't you show up like with pack bags? Was that, that was, was I, Marcus? Oh, no, that was that Marcus. Was okay. Yeah. All right. I, Mar which is another <laughs> guy that I said, but for some reason I was thinking, um, did Rob come like, you know, with his bags packed, you know, a lot of confidence, like, Hey, I'm here, but okay. That was Marcus, my bad. But anyways, I met Rob back in college. I rushed him. He was one of those guys as a rush chairman. It's a, I didn't really realize that job, it's a big job and you're bringing on all these guys to have future memories. But Rob was one of the, my favorite guys I signed and just um, yeah, an, an amazing dude. So um, Rob is in the world of recruiting. I'm gonna let him kind of get into that, but I also kind of want to touch on, when I look at Rob, Rob has actually created a, he's a business owner, but in a, in a, like a destination, like Sun Valley area, that's just, you know, a place that I would live if I could. Um, and maybe someday I will, but I really am impressed with, you know, you creating, um, you know, a business, owning a business in a, in a destination like Sun Valley and having a lifestyle like you do. So anyways, Rob, why don't you talk a little bit about what it is you do if you're on the plane, flying to California and somebody sits next to you and they just say, hey, what it is that you do? How would you uh, respond? Uh, you know, the I guess the elevator pitch on the on the job is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we are recruiters for the tech sector. Um, and that, that means we find both the engineering talent and also the sales and marketing talent for tech companies. Um, most of our clients are, uh, are small, uh, you know, oftentimes sort of a, a seed funded up to maybe a, a series C, series D. Generally, when companies get bigger than that, they bring their their own like you know sourcing talent in house, or they have a little more structure. But prior to that, we're really useful in in helping people you know both define uh, what it is they're looking for, and then finding them the folks and locking them down. So, I I usually wait to get real specific, but like. There's a, I know there's people, I know people, friends of mine that are in your world, your industry. Um, what is it, I mean, what is it about you and your company, Redfish, like, that is different? Like, why, why, why would you hire Rob versus the other, op, you know, companies out there? Like, you've obviously been in this game for a long time. How would you, do, how would you, I guess, say, differentiate yourself from the competition? You know, part of it is just that, you know, I know that sounds like a, a low barrier to entry when you can just say, Hey, actually having been in the industry for 30 years, it's one of those industries. It's interesting. You know, um, when, when the, when the going is good, when the market's cranking, you have a lot of people to come into the, the industry, but there's a lot of kind of fair weather players in it. Uh, meaning when things tighten up and man, we've had some doozies in the years that I've been doing that. So I'm almost, I'm almost 30 years into the job. I'm at 29. Um, but you know, we've had three or four massive shakeouts in it. And, um, I can't remember who it was that said it, that, you know, success is almost just about being there, you know, half of it's showing up or, or you're, you're still standing when the dust settles type of thing. Um, it really makes you um, focus on some of the fundamentals of the job, I guess, is to answer your question of what di differentiates us. Um, you have to get really scrappy and you have to figure out why somebody's going to work with you. And a lot of that is who you are. And, um, you know, you and I had a conversation just a minute ago and talking about how there are industries that get commoditized. Our industry is very much one of those things. 
And um, the way through that, I have found, at least in my experience, has been um, the relationship piece of it. You know, it's a very human job. Um, we're dealing with humans changing careers and we're dealing with companies trying to build themselves, oftentimes young companies that really have to um, make some critical hires and get those hires right. Because if they screw up here, you know, there's ripple effects down the road for them. Um, and so, you know, with that comes, you know, some maybe some trepidation on both parts, you know, God, I want to make sure I get this thing right. It's a big deal for all parties involved. And so that human piece um, permeates, you know, our job. We're constantly dealing with people having very real um, um, decisions to make with regard to the impact on their families or the impact on their careers and the impact, you know, these things. And so I think um, to, uh, the long winded answer is um, being sensitive to that, but also aware of um, the pieces that you can help mitigate makes a recruiter a good recruiter. So. I know some guys, gals that are, are in your industry, um, some deal with maybe more short-term contract workers. Some deal with long-term, like getting married versus dating. I don't know if that's a good analogy, but like, yeah, yeah. Are, are you actually putting people in for the long haul or are these like six month, nine month um, contracts? I'd love to do more on the the staffing side, but everything we do, I mean, I'd say everything, 95% of what we do is uh, full-time permanent roles. So okay. yeah, that they are definitely the marriage kind of um, uh, example, I guess. Is that more common, like the full-time? Because I know guys, gals that do the short term, is it like 50-50 or are there more of you than the others? You know... I almost feel like we're the anomaly. I think a lot of people get into our business um, from a revenue standpoint. The other way um, is really attractive just because it's almost like um, reoccurring revenue. You know, yeah. you place somebody for six months and, um, you know, you're kind of you're getting residuals on that. Whereas ours is kind of a one shop or one time, you know uh fee so yeah. i would love to have the other piece as part of our our uh, our business like have it way more on it but it just seems like our setup is way more conducive to the the full time for our clients i usually wait for the i, I love to get into compensation and i'm not asking you rob what it is you make but in your industry how how are people comp i mean you're a business owner but Sure. Let's just say you want to get in the world of recruiting and you're putting people in for the long haul. It, so is it a hundred percent commission bonus, uh, a one shot deal? You put somebody in and do they have to stay employed like for a for year sure. before you get the full um, payout? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not a year. Um, so we do have a guarantee period. It varies a little bit. Generally it's around 60 days um, is our uh, guarantee period, but we get paid based on the, on the base salary of the folks that we place. So, you know, there might be, there might be equity, there might be sign on bonuses or benefits or things like that. We're, we're not associated with those pieces of the, of the package. Um, it's just the base salary. Um, okay. Unless it's a sales position, sales is different because companies structure things really differently within those setups. So we, we typically base our comp off of OTE, which is, you know, on target earnings, meaning base and expected commission, not, hey, if somebody absolutely kills it, they're going to make X and we're trying to, you know, piggyback on that. It's just sort of, you know, what somebody who's doing their job and doing it well would make. Okay. And then going back to the, the contract world, like maybe a yeah. nine, that's more like, hey, listen, I've got this employee that you can have for nine months. And is it based off, like, how is that compensation put together? Yeah, typically that's an hourly, you know, those guys come in and they, um, uh, the, the company has a budget, the, the, the talent or the, the person who would be doing the work has an hourly they need. And then there's a markup for the recruiter. Um, you know, some of the factors, I don't know how, how interesting this is for people, but some of the factors are whether or not we payroll them. Um, if we actually 
have them on our payroll, there's more of a markup because there's more burden, you know, for the um, uh, for the company in terms of, you know, I, I mean, in, in all the all the all the pieces that go into having an employee that you have to pay. Um, but if the company does it, our markup is lowered because they're carrying the burden of a of a of an employee. So I'm thinking when you're going after or you're, you know, looking at landing a large client, maybe a company out of California, is it harder in your in your world to bring on the client or to uh, bring on the talent? Like if I'm in high demand and I'm looking for a a job, there's, there's multiple companies like yours I can go to. So do you find yourself, is it harder to do one versus the other or are they equal? That's funny. Um, so it's kind of a pendulum really, you know, you have, um, you have a market and the market, um, varies, right? Like we talked about, you'll have times, especially in the tech world where, um, it's on fire and you've, I mean, it's like drinking from a fire hose and you have companies that can't hire fast enough. And then you have times, especially, you know, when we deal with, like I mentioned, sort of the smaller firms, they're really susceptible to some of the the, the, the market changes as like, you know, this last year when the feds raised their rates, that really impacted the VC community, which definitely, um, you know, cramped down on the 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 small companies that were sort of dependent on those funds and so at that point the market you know really tightens and they have to be really careful about you know it's not that we're going to hire four engineers we're going to hire one and ask him to do the job of you know two and a half people until we actually you know get this bigger chunk from the from the vcs that we're depending on it's that kind of thing so right now it's it's more in the middle. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, it would, pro I would probably say that's a little easier to find the talent than, um, a really great client, um, right now, but that's just timing. I was thinking this morning when I was about our conversation that we're going to have and, you know, me living in Sun Valley and yeah, I remember, and just, um, just what a cool world that is. And then I'm thinking like how you might be really different is you might be able to attract the people that want the lifestyle, but you know, there's not a ton of corporate opportunities. You know, uh, they always joke, you either have three jobs or you three houses. And I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard that, but when yeah. I've lived there a few times, like I experienced, there's a quite a diversity in, in income and, and people's lifestyles. But like, do you find yourself like, being able to say, listen, I've got this amazing, beautiful world that you can come live in um, and also tap into a corporate job versus maybe, you know, working at a bar or tune in skis. Right. Is that kind of a value proposition that you might have that you think other companies don't? Oh, and you're talking like for me, hiring employees for Redfish. Yeah. And I guess maybe I'm assuming I, they don't even need to live there, really. I guess part of me was thinking that you know, you've got people that can come live there, but you're right. right. I mean, you probably have people that live all over the world, right? In, in terms of people that work for Redfish, my company? Well, or maybe or, people that you place. Oh yeah, they're all over. A lot of, you know, that's been a huge shift um, in our industry since I started okay. is just the, and I think COVID frankly kind of forced the hand on it, but it was, um, you know, the, the acceptance and the um, the willingness for our clients to um, have remote employees um, has addressed a number of issues, you know, um, especially around the shortage of talent in the tech world. If you could allow somebody to live in, you know, Minnesota and not have to live in the Bay Area, then um, you not only, you know, could potentially find somebody you wouldn't normally have, um, but you wouldn't necessarily have to, you know, pay Bay Area prices for these people to to live or afford the kind of li the, 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 you know, lifestyle that they were used to. So that's been big, you know, and, and to your point, yeah, boy, living in Sun Valley, it was, it was what allowed me to, to do it. I knew I wanted a career um, and I wasn't willing to, 
to, to live here if it meant being just a ski bum type of thing, you know, like I knew, you know, for the way that I was wired that I needed a career and I wanted something, but if there was a way to, to, to have both and be, you know, be here and have a career, then I was going to do whatever it took to do it. And I want to touch on that too, because I think when, when someone's watching Rob right now, if you guys are listening and watching and you might not really understand it, but you know, again, tell, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but like, I, I, I don't know a lot of people that have lived in beautiful areas like you resort type towns, and yet we're able to tap into the benefits of uh, a real job, a, a real career. I, I guess going back, you and I went to University of Washington together. I think you traveled. I know you, I think you took Japanese, if I remember, yeah. and spent some time over there. Yeah. Was, was it always like, hey, I'm going to go live in this beautiful town and then I'll figure the rest out? Or like, how did it all come together? I know you had family or I think your sister in the Valley, but yeah. walk me back. Cause I think you and I, you know, life happens. We separated. I hadn't talked and all of a sudden you're living there. What brought you there? Um, this town in particular was sisters. Uh, I had two that were living here. Um, and, um, one was getting married. I actually, her, her, uh, fiance, was the one that introduced me to this job and then i um interviewed with a guy who had who had started the business in sun valley he had come from los angeles and it was just you know so i got the job um and i thought to myself i don't know if it's legit you know i i didn't know anything about recruiting um i was coming out of um uh the uw and I had worked, so I'd majored, I double majored in finance and Japanese, and I thought I was for sure going the route of, you know, you know, the PACREM um, finance world. And I was working at Bank of America, and that's how I paid for school. And um, so to me, I was just thinking, you know, it was a funny, it was a funny uh, time for me because I was so linear in my thought about what I was going to do with my career. But I had this moment of looking at when I had any spare money, which was very little, you know, in college and any spare time, it was always on like camping gear or going to the mountains or, you know, um, you know, getting a new water filter or whatever for my backpack or whatever. So I thought to myself, well, maybe it's worth giving this thing a shot. Right. And, uh, and for me, I thought, even if it doesn't pan out, I'm in Sun Valley for a year. I never did like the Europe backpack around whatever, you know, that wasn't part of my thing. So I kind of wrote it off as I might pull this thing off and it's worth a shot. And so with having family here, it made it easier. Um, and then I came in and I, you know, the job really kind of lined up with my strengths and the stuff that I I liked controlling my income. I liked being able to, you know, um, dictate um, how much effort I wanted to put into something. And for me, I was super motivated and it just, it lined up well and I had a chance to buy the business and, uh, and did so. Yeah. I guess um, just listening to you talk, Rob, I'm like, I'm going to come back with another question. Like, I think it's, I, I bring on guests that have different, views of career and they've done it but like i look at what you've done you know i use the word brave like i think you were young and you made a, a leap and a lot of people don't do that you know they they kind of operate in their safe little world a lot of voices especially their parents of you know go be a lawyer or a doctor or go yeah. cpa can you give any advice just maybe to think about somebody that's listening that's in college maybe they just graduated and they're really struggling and they're thinking, move to Sun Valley, a ski town, I can do that. And actually, is there any advice that you might want to give to somebody that um, might be struggling with just the mindset around sh such a 180? You know, I have looked back um, on a number of things, a lot of choices, not just career choices that I've made, um, but just life choices that I've made. and. I will say generally, and I think of myself as as maybe naturally fairly conservative. You know, um, I 
I, like I said, I wasn't willing to just go, it's Sun Valley or bust. And I'm going to, I'm going to work whatever it takes to get there. Like it was very measured. Um, but there was, um, the, uh, to, to answer your question, there were a couple of pivotal moments and the ones where I actually took the risk were the ones that I'm most proud of, um, that I, that I think, um, I would encourage people to kind of listen to that, that, that internal voice that's really easy to discount, you know, and say, um, if it's there, at least entertain it, you know, think about it and go, okay. And, and maybe work backwards. What's the worst thing that could happen? You know, go from that side and work backwards to, um, what's the best thing that could happen. And, uh, for me, you know, I had an opportunity to do this, this, um, proved to me I could do a job that was really centric to at the time Silicon Valley. So I knew I was doing it remotely, which allowed me to start thinking about, well, could I, you know, could I um, further this adventure? And we had, as you know, we had a couple of years that we took um, abroad and did the work abroad um, out of the country with the family, which was a huge learning experience, but also had risk. And then, um, you know, also have the opportunity to bring some of the, the, the young folks from the office and give them that opportunity, which just, it just keeps that, that, that fire burning a little bit, you know, of, of why we're on the planet outside of just making money. Totally. Yeah. And I, I, I remember your time in Costa Rica, for example, and yeah. it's like, I just, you know, life is about memories. And I think you, you've proved, you know, the way you and your family have lived life. I mean, I don't think you'll ever have regrets. So I applaud you for that. Thanks. Um, so getting back into the core of recruiting, like I have a, you know, I feel like I'm a pretty smart dude. I'm, I interview a lot of people about different careers. I'm always thinking about, um, you know, what, what would it be like to, so when I think of recruiting, like I think of, okay, you gotta be a likable guy. You gotta be presentable. People need to trust you. Um, what is it about recruiting that people don't know? Like, you know, we have these assumptions about what it would be like, like, I think I'd be a good recruiter, but you've been in it 29 years, uh, going on 30. Uh, what is it about recruiting that people think they know, but they don't? Um, I think that the, I think what the way you described it is the way a lot of people think about recruiting and really, um, recruiting has changed so dramatically from when I started. So, so just to give you an idea, when we, when I started recruiting, people would actually like mail their resume to you, like through the mail with stamps, you know, like that kind of thing that you'd open up and you'd make copies for people in the office. Cause we were all sharing resumes that came in but we had um we had a computer that would that would you know store information on companies but to get the resume to those guys we would you know fax it over and that kind of thing like that to where we are these days where um you know it is so automated it is all digital um and then you have AI coming in and making a huge impact, just like, you know, going digital made a huge impact. The, the ability to be likable and whatnot, you get fewer and fewer chances to even get in front of people because we're all screening, right? We're just, you know, I have 43,000 unread, you know, emails in my inbox. I, I haven't even gotten through them. Um, and just as a, you know, a point, I'm one of those emails in, in people's boxes and I know it. And we're all just trying to, to slow down the onslaught of people trying to get our business, our attention, our time, um, getting, you know, being likable or being uh, personable and having people trust you gets more and more challenging just to get the audience. Right. So, um, you know, I think, I think, recruiting um those skills are still critical but um being really persistent and willing to constantly reinvent yourself that would be the piece i think that um um gets overlooked 
Yeah. I want to get into AI here in a second. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I'm a big, I don't know if you ever listen to All In podcast. Um, it's four, four VC guys. I've learned a lot about a lot of things listening to these guys. And I guess one of my questions, the question I asked you just a little bit ago, like, do you have to have a skill set of really understanding the pain of a business? Like, instead of just being the friendly guy that people like, and you got a great talent, I mean, you probably need to get under the covers behind behind the cover and the sheets or whatever to really understand like the business, like, you know, the P and L, I mean, are you, do you get into that? Like really, or, or is it more simple? You mean with our clients, like their P and L and that sort of thing? Well, just really yeah. understanding their pain points of like, yeah. I mean, Hey, I need a good engineer. or I need someone who can write this code or I need a good salesperson, but you might need to go way deeper than that. Yeah. And I think that's part of what's helped uh differentiate us to be honest is because our clients are oftentimes that you know first time business builders you know these are startups and it might be the first time this person's gone off on their own or they came up with a great idea and now they're trying to build a business and uh, as with so many things you know sometimes the 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 really brilliant engineer isn't a brilliant business person or they're decent, but they're like us kind of figuring it out as they go along. And so if we can help them avoid some of those pitfalls, that's a big, that's a big value add for us. So they rarely will say, here's all the, you know, they would give us all of the, the, the nitty gritty, but oftentimes they'll come to us with a need. And what we'll do is sort of help them maybe redefine it or bring up some other components that might be important for them as they're looking at making that hire or they bring us four hires or five positions that they're thinking about hiring and we help triage like i would probably do this and then this person you know right now you've got this person here we're trying to um help them see why it might help to to do in a different order or add some you know uh or take some positions out that's that can be really helpful just for these guys trying to get where you know, hit their own objectives and they've got milestones they need to meet with, with VCs as well. So if we can help them, then there's, you know, we can start um, establishing some of that trust and some of that extra value, not just, um, I don't think recruiting has the best reputation. You know, it is kind of car salesman-y reputation is how um, some people look at it, like you're a necessary evil. But if you've, if you can establish yourself as much more of a partner um, with these folks um, and and then prove it, then um, you stand a good chance of um, repeat business and referrals and some of the stuff that's so valuable in our biz. It's interesting to hear you say that because I would never think of you, your industry as like a commodity or a car salesman type. Like sometimes I think my business lending, you know, when I lose clients to rocket mortgage or something, right because it's such a short-term relationship, um, like you can really yeah. make or break the success of a business by bringing in the wrong people. Like to me, it's a very significant thing you do, um, in my opinion, especially since you more focus on the long-term type of uh, employee versus like the short-term. So right. it's interesting for me to hear you say that. Um, what's the loyalty like in your in your industry? like? Like, do you have 20 clients um, that you work with consistently? Do you have a hundred? I mean, is there a point to where, like in my world with lending, you know, I have realtors, I have CPAs, I have financial planners, basically anybody that's in front of people talking about money. For you, I mean, is the goal just to solidify like a really strong core of 25 corporations and then you're good? Or are you trying to get to a thousand? No, I, th we really kind of work in small batches. Um, um, and we, our business plan is much more along the lines of doing more placements with fewer companies versus the the flip side of that, which is when we started, the, the idea was just the opposite. You've got a good candidate, send them to a thousand places because somebody's going to want that, that talent. And, um, we really, um, work almost the flip of that, meaning we will be working for a client 
um, generally uh, to to find the talent that they're looking for, bringing them, they get first right of refusal. If at that point they decide this person's not a fit, we can certainly take that person and bring them to other clients and that sort of thing. But for me, I, I would say if I had, you know, generally we would, you know, look at maybe having 10 or 15 clients at a time. Um, and if the, it's steady like that, that's really good business for us. That's really, you- that's great. That's a great cadence for us. Got it. When you say clients, are you talking about employers that are actually need people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, okay. you know, companies that are hiring Yep. and then generally they, they ask us to help them fill other roles. If we do a good job on those, um, you know, they'll help us, they'll ask us to help them fill other positions, but having, you know, having a hundred companies, you know, with, um, immediate needs would be, it, it, it just, we wouldn't be able to service them all. Yeah, no, I get it. I, you know, as far as like people that you hire, the talent, are they loyal? Like, let's say you get somebody 25 years old, you put them into a job, you know, they're there for four years. Do you see them again? Do they come back and say, Hey Rob, I'm kind of looking, or is it like a lost leader? Like they're gone. No, no, we get that Um, because you build relationships with the talent, right, of these folks. Um, If they are still working at the company that we placed them, we have to say we can't work with you. You know, we wouldn't place somebody and also pull them from a company that paid us to find them, if that makes sense. Um, And there are I know there are companies out there that would do that. Uh, We don't. Um, But if somebody has left a company and coming to us and saying, Hey, we work together. We would absolutely work with them and, and help them. Yeah. And I don't mean to push you on this question, but I'm yeah. just, I'm curious. Like I totally get like, um, ethically, you don't place somebody and then pull them. Yeah. But I also know that sometimes when you're looking for a job, it's you're more attractive when you're employed. So let's just say you have somebody that's been with the company that you place for four years and now they're kind of thinking, they want to make a move. How do you handle that? Or do you just say, listen, I can't work with you until you actually leave? Um, I don't know if that's a too sensitive of a question, but I'm no, just no, kind of. No, it's, it's, it's a great question because it's, you know, it's this area that people f- find is sort of a gray area. What I usually do is I give advice. Like, you know, um, I can give them an idea of what the market's doing or some areas they might look or whatnot. But in terms, I try to keep it really, really clean. If they're still at the company that we place them at, we won't be sending their resume to other places. If they've left, we will. But that doesn't mean I can't talk to them or help them or or whatnot, because um, there's still people and their clients as well. You know, they're 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 talent that that we've we've helped. Okay. Um, so as we wind this down, I, I want to yeah. kind of ask you if we go, if we went back in time, back to the old, good old Alpha Delta world, you know, and, and you were to do this again, knowing what you know about recruiting. I mean, I know it's a kind of a, a question. A lot of people say, I wouldn't do anything different because I've learned, you know, wouldn't, but knowing what you know now, would you have approached recruiting differently? Um, would you have done something differently? Uh, I, or would you have done it the exact same way? Oh, no, I definitely do things differently. Uh, let's see. <laughs> and start? the reason, and Robbie, the reason I ask this is because yeah. I also, I'm kind of indirectly asking you for advice on somebody that's thinking they want to get into recruiting yeah. and just l- learning what you've learned. You know, what would be your advice to somebody about, you know, following in your footsteps or not? Yeah. Um, so. You knew me um, when I basically at the at the age when I entered recruiting. And so my personality was probably um, fairly apparent of how I was wired. Um, I came into it and that personality really did serve me very, very well in the job. Um, I had a lot of I had a lot of self-discipline. I was motivated to do the job. I I work hard. Um, I can take the grind. I have this piece of me that um, um, I think the grind really wears people down. For me, that's 
as long as I don't get out of the grind and then try to regain, you know, get back into the grind, I can just, it, it, it works for me. Um, what I missed at the beginning of this job was the relationship piece. And my wife, um, Heidi, did this job. That's actually how we met, strangely, 20 whatever years ago. And Heidi did the job completely opposite to the way that I approached it. She was all relationship, you know, found out about people's families, found out about um, some, like she would get done and or make a placement or whatnot and have the full life story of people. Whereas I was trying to, you know, I was so focused on efficiency that um, I was getting why this person was or was not, you know, um, applicable to the job that I was working on. And and I ended up missing out, I think, a ton. I would have made my life a lot easier for myself had I been able to recognize the importance of that connection and the and the and the um, uh, the relationship, because ultimately those people go on to be hiring managers and and it's so much easier to reconnect with somebody that you had a connection with in the first place versus just what I thought the value I brought to the table was in performance, if that makes sense. Um, but performance, uh, I find nowadays to be a little bit shallow. It's just a, that's that commodity piece that I'm, that you and I talked about that, um, uh, you need to be more than that. And it took me a long time to realize it, um, frankly. I also think that's true for how I managed. Um, I just assumed everybody was wired like me, and they are not. Um, and I think I lost some really good people that I could have kept had I had a little bit more awareness of myself and them and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think I think I learned a lot about people from doing a people job and and doing parts of it really well and parts of it not very well <laughs> if that makes sense well i i want to make sure because in all the podcasts i've done I, I you actually are you brought something up that i haven't really even heard or thought of but it hits home with me and i want to make sure i'm on track with you so tell me if i'm off but like are you saying that the way i'm interpreting this is that you might have been very I don't want to say transactional, but very just about the numbers and stand like kind of like dating. You weren't going deep with right. conversation, but you were successful. You were hitting the numbers, but you were missing out on kind of like the important stuff of like really getting to know people. You were kind of moving on to your numbers and your quotas and your commissions. And maybe you kind of lost sight of the actual relationship. Um, is, am I off or is that... No. That's right. And it's interesting, right? There's a balance there because I don't, I actually looked down a little bit on people that I could feel were just, in my opinion, wasting time on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, talking to somebody about this and that. And they're, you know, for me, it's like I could already have made four or five more phone calls in the time that that person was, you know, um, t spending time on piece of, on, on information that didn't seem even relevant, you yeah. know? It was it, that's that's how I looked at it. And I think that there's a balance, right? Yep. You can um, you can stay in your for some people, those conversations are their comfort zone. And so they stay there because they're comfortable, not because it's making them particularly effective at the job. And then you had somebody like me on the other end of that spectrum that was much more transactional. And I thought and I feel like there's a piece to it that even now looking back people aren't talking to me because they need a best friend right like i have a i'm coming with a proposal and i'm respectful of your time as well and i'm not going to try to take 30 minutes of your time to try to get this thing through i want to be um respectful of the fact that you're giving me an audience so somewhere in between there there was a better way um, for me to, um, there, there, there were, there was a better way for me to, to do it. It didn't need to be quite as transactional though. It, like I mentioned it, it, it benefited me from my, my performance and then ultimately allowed me to buy the business because I was performing, you know? Yeah, I get it. It's, it's a, it's a tricky one, but 
but it no, is there. It's interesting. I'll be honest, Rob. I think I, you and I are similar. I think for my pre, you know, I'm not that old, but when I was younger, I was so focused on numbers and yeah. sales and, and I, you know, I wasn't that I didn't want to go deep with people. I just, I was very disciplined on doing my job. And then I wanted to be home with my family or yeah. be home and coach. So I wasn't out having drinks with realtors or, you know, I, I just, I, I think I kind of, I don't want to say messed up, but I see people in my industry now that have really, really strong relationships that go beyond the, the business. And uh, I think that's really good advice. Um, yeah. um, one thing about you, and I, I don't know if this is repetitive, but like, I know you're super humble, but you also are very, you have a wide range of skill sets and you're very talented and you're, you're, you're obviously one of those guys, anyone who meets you, like you, 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 you leave a mark. My question to you is when it, as it pertains to recruiting, like, what would you say your, um, what's that word? Uh, secret sauce or your super hero skill? Like what, what is it about Rob? What do you think makes you really good at what you do? If you were just to be brutally honest? Well, thank you for, for saying that. I, that's a, that is a tough question. Um, or what does your competition say about you? Or what do people say like about, Hey, you should go talk to Rob. Why, why do people come to you for what they come to you for? Um, I think I have a, um, an, an ability to be persuasive, but genuine. Um, and I think that if I'm that, that I've never phrased it like that. Um, I, I've talked to people that, you know, at one point there were, I don't know, 130 people recruiting, um, that we, that were sort of under this umbrella and I have had people talk to me about knowing about my performance and talking to me, like wondering how I did it and trying to emulate it and that sort of thing. And I really think it was, it was desire and just grind that, that made me successful there. But in terms of like how I, why, why somebody would work with me um, as a client coming to Redfish, I think um, that over the years, I have an ability to, to listen and to kind of um, um, maybe hear what's not being said and, um, and get, get to that in a way that maybe is digestible, even if it's not exactly what somebody wants to hear. So um, those, those traits have served me pretty well. Um, but yeah, I, I still, and I say this to my son, uh, you know, who's almost entering the wor the workforce. A lot of it is just being willing to show up and 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 work your butt off. People notice, and people notice, um, you know, if you do it with a good attitude, and they notice if you do it with like a chip on your shoulder. So you know, you've got a choice. Might as well just have a good attitude if you're going to be at the office. Work your butt off, like. I never, I, I don't know. It always, yeah. it always surprised me when you'd have coworkers or whatnot that you were working with that were kind of mailing it in. You're like, you're already in the office, right? You're not on the mountain skiing. You're yeah. not hiking. So why wouldn't you be busting it? Because it's just going to benefit you to potentially make more money, do, you know, look better to your boss, whatever it is that, that yeah. that's on, on your mind. No, I'm just thinking, I mean, you keep saying a lot of the same, and that I hear grit, like, you haven't used the word grit, but like you have grit. Um, like you do the hard work and sometimes it's success is doing the hard work. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's a, a consistent theme for you. And also like, you're just not a bullshitter. You're, you're genuine. And I think people, I think that's one of the things I'm good at is there's been a lot of times I've said, I don't think you should do alone or buy this house yeah. or whatever. I'm not really after the deal. I'm after the client. Cause I think right. at the end of the day, we all kind of want to have people we trust, whether it's buying suits or a car or a doctor or, you know, even your favorite bar, like bartender, maybe that's a stretch, but, um, but, you know, I think people seek out honesty and, and you and I are both in roles where when we're, we do a deal, we make money. So there's an agenda, but I think you're also, 
you don't have necessarily the typical agenda of commission or closing the deal. So you're a good listener. And yeah. uh, anyways, I just think you, I, I know you're very good at what you do, but I'm not surprised that you've done what you've done. Um, two last questions and we'll wrap it up. I always ask this and you've kind of answered it in ways, but let's just say you have, we won't use coal, but let's just say somebody is really struggling and they might have skill sets that translate to maybe the world of recruiting. What would you get, what would be your advice to somebody that's, that finally gets in front of you and they're like, Hey, I, I really want to be in recruiting. What would you say to them? I think I'd ask them why. Um, and, uh, and keep that reason, uh, that they want to get into recruiting or why they think they'd be good at recruiting or whatnot on the, uh, the forefront of their mind as they do it. I think it's a job that um, weeds out a lot of people. And so you mentioned grit and that and that kind of stuff. I have a lot of respect for bravery and grit. Um, those two things um, for me and authenticity, those three things probably are the are are my top three in terms of um, people I hire um, and what I think has helped make me successful. So um, if somebody was going to get into it, I think I would just, um, make sure that the, the, the reality of the job is that there is a grind component to this. And if you think you're going to get in, be, you know, some people want to get into recruiting because they want to help people um, find great jobs. Like it feels like this altruistic component, right? Like you're going to, you're going to find somebody a great job and they're going to be super grateful and, um, and go on, you know, there's going to be rainbows and butterflies. And the, the reality is it's a sales job. So it becomes like you have an agenda and you're talking to somebody. So can you reconcile that internally, right? I can talk to you and have an agenda and also be authentic, right? Those are not mutually exclusive. You cannot, you know, if you're feeling like having an agenda makes you inauthentic, you can't do this job, right? So you have to find a way that you can, and maybe that's in the, in the clients that you work with, like you have to believe in their product or their environment or their culture or whatever it is, what, however, however you do it. And I think that that's true of all sales. Authenticity is a massive component. So make sure that you know what it is that, um, that you believe in and, and, and you can be successful in it as long as you're putting in the work to do it, but don't come in thinking you're just, that people are going to be super grateful to work with you and really excited to take your call and uh, and really happy after the tr the 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 deal's done because a lot of times they look at you like a uh you know like a service provider so you have to find that i guess that internal value on your own yeah it's funny i'm just thinking about like i remember going back in high school and like i played sports and I was pretty good. And then I remember I go to college and now I'm, that part of my identity is gone and I'm now right. at, in a big fraternity. And it's like, you kind of have this, um, I don't want to say false image of yourself, but, and then you get into the real world. And I think it's like a smack in the face. Like that's the thing about this whole career thing is I struggled. I, I started selling long distance for AT&T and I'm like, shit, I'm selling long distance, like, and I'm selling dial tone and six second incremental billing. And I'm trying to like sell these points to why this small business needs to switch their long distance to me. And it's kind of humbling. And I, I guess I, what I hear you saying, and it's like, Hey, listen, it's not going to be, you're not going to jump to the front of the line. You're going to have to put in the work, uh, do the work, you know, show some grit. So I think that's a wake up call for a lot of people, but, um, I do. I know this is another question I was going to ask you, but it's a big answer. You don't have to give me a big answer, but you know, I, I do a lot of, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and we go really deep on AI and, you know, on a very elementary level, you know, AI, a lot of people are worried that AI will take away jobs. And yeah. a lot of people think they're actually going to do the opposite, you know, instead of it. So I guess in their terms of recruiting, when you're trying to find people to do work that maybe can get scaled through AI, do you feel like your whole industry is just blown up or do you feel like AI is actually helping you um, be more successful? Yeah. Um, 
And you're right, though, about the fear of it. Um, and my son and his friends, it's top of mind. Like, they're worried. They're worried that the, that there are, you know, and they're smart kids coming out of good schools that are worried about AI. Um, with regard to how it plays out in, in my industry, um, it's more noise right now. Um, okay. it's, it's automating a lot of the reach outs, you know, like the, 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 you know, as a prospecting clients, for example, um, and it, and it, again, it, it's sort of a, a disenchanting, uh, component when you realize that this is a automated bot reaching out to you as a person. So it, it makes the human part of our job, even that much more critical. But again, you've got to get the audience and you've got to be creative on how you do that. Um, and that approach has, has morphed more times than I can, I, I can mention, you know, since I started doing the job, but um, I, I, it certainly, you know, AI is going to be able to find resumes that people had hired us to find. It's going to be able to reach people and connect things. Um, so it will definitely affect our business, but our business has a fundamental human piece to it that I truly believe is going to be always uh, a component. So there might be fewer recruiters um, in the future, we might be doing our job differently, but um, um, I think the, the the human piece of a human job um, will always be there. Love it. Anything I missed that I didn't ask uh, that you think just being in the industry you're in that should have been mentioned that you want to leave the audience with? You know, I think um, just from my own like reflection on the job, um, I've been super grateful for it allowing me to live where I wanted to live. And like you spend time with my family and have flexibility and that sort of thing. And I think watching people try to make career decisions, um, I get to see it every day. Um, but if you can incorporate um, some of the benefits of the job, um, as opposed to just the job, you know, if you look for, if you look for a job to be also the thing that gives you joy and and worth and um, and value and um, and all these things, it can be kind of limiting and it can be a lot of pressure on that job. Um, I don't know if this if I'm saying this correctly, but I do think if you also take into account what that job allows you to do um, with your life, with your loved ones, with your you know, hobbies and that sort of thing. Um, you can open up a lot of different career paths that you might not have considered previously because maybe the work wasn't the way you, you know, like, for example, I worked my ass off to get that Japanese degree. It was, it was the, the hardest I had worked in school. I lived over in Japan, that sort of thing. I don't use it at all. Right. I had to give that up. And I did not think that I was going to give it up. I thought that that was going to be the foundation of what I did with my career. But gratefully for my former self, I am I'm very thankful that I, I had a little bit of wherewithal to go. If I can do this in Sun Valley, then I am willing to give that up. So I think if you can just keep your mind a little bit open on what the role is and bring into what the what that might allow you to do with your life as a whole um you know a happiness level goes up and you don't put it all yeah. on the job so you know rob that was amazing because i mean that's kind of the crux of this podcast is i think what you just said was you know a lot of like i have i like one of my faults is I've always identified myself with my career. So I'm in a career where there's a lot of people that do what I do and it's very commoditized. And so sometimes it, you know, it, it's tough, right? Like I wanted to be more special. I wanted to make a bigger impact. You know, there's a million people out there that can do your loan. And so what you're saying is it's sometimes reframing. It's okay. It's not exactly what it is you do, but what does the career allow you to do in terms of your life? You know, be present with your kids, 
coach their sports, travel. Uh, I mean, I think it's a really great message that you left uh, the audience with. So um, anyway, I appreciate it. You're a great dude. Um, I hope to see you soon. Um, thanks so much for coming on and, and please tell uh, Heidi hi for me. I will. Thanks for having me and love to the family. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you later. All right, Cheers. buddy.